Not in the case. I mean, the cheapest piece of worthless crap you got in the whole miserable store. All right. Five bucks. Sold. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 176 scale Russian T3485 or a T3476. The model that we have here is built for my own personal collection and it's not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. But with this model here being 176, this is not a scale that I actively work in, nor is it a scale that I take commissions in. So for this video over here, this is just going to be a one-off. However, if anyone is interested in having me work on the other projects and scales that I mentioned before, I can be reached by the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. This model here was built mostly out of the box, however I did go ahead and add extra details onto the model, bringing up to the condition that we have here. In this video, we're going to be going over all these additions, modifications, and we're also going to be giving this model a thorough inbox review. So stay tuned because there's going to be a bunch of info coming right at you. To start this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this is a vehicle that hardly needs an introduction. This is the ubiquitous Soviet T-34 medium tank. Specifically, depending on which turret this model has at any given time, either the T-34-76 or the T-34-85. And although some people, specifically the ones that used to watch TV shows of the 1990s, will tell you that the T-34 is the greatest tank design of World War II, and that is definitely not the case, the T-34 is definitely a significant vehicle in world history and is definitely a iconic vehicle in terms of armor history and development. The T-34 was an excellent tank, although it's just not the best tank as a lot of people like to proclaim it to be. The T-34 has its its origins in the 1930s and the 1920s with the Christie tank. The Christie tank was a tank designed in the United States by Mr. Christie, I'm surprised, and uh, his tank had a lot of very forward-thinking design cues to it. He showed it to the U.S. Army, however, the U.S. Army wasn't interested, so he had the design and he sold it and licensed it out to anyone that would be willing to pay for it. One of the customers he had was with the Soviet Union. They saw the Christie suspension and they liked it a lot and so they purchased the rights for it. When the Soviets received the Christie suspension, they went ahead and developed it on their own. The first vehicles to incorporate this pattern of suspension was the BT series. The BT series performed very, very well and the, the Soviet designers went ahead and took this design and pursued it and refined it a bit more. The vehicle that came from this was the T-34. This vehicle entered into adoption with the Soviet Army, or the Red Army, I should say, back in, you guessed it, 1934. It's how the Soviets like to label their things. It's pretty easy in that regard. Where the T-34's design really excels is that this vehicle can be mass-produced somewhat easily and with relatively simplistic tooling. And this is what made the T-34 the legend that it really is. The T-34's most noteworthy feature is its sloped angular upper hull. With this design, the designers were able to give the vehicle sufficient armor protection but utilizing thinner armor plates. Because of the sloped nature, this gave the cross section of the armor the same thickness as if a vertical plate that was thicker was used in the same location. Also, because of the angled slopes, this gave the vehicle the propensity for incoming rounds to glance off, which obviously was something that aided with the armor protection. It's really this design that caught the Germans completely off guard when they encountered them at first on the Eastern Front, and which later the Germans basically ripped off when they came up with the later generation of tank designs, such as the Panther and the King Tiger. Because of the armor design, the vehicle weighed in at about 26 tons, which in combination with the suspension and the transmission and engine that this vehicle incorporates, gave it excellent mobility on both on and off-road conditions. For the vehicle's engine, it utilized a single V12 diesel engine, which gave it, again, the excellent performance that I just mentioned. The vehicle was originally intended to have an all-cast turret, again for speed of 
production, also for good armor protection, but the main armament was originally intended to be a 76 millimeter. This was deemed to be more than adequate for the time, and it really more or less was. The T-34-76 in several different skies saw service with the Soviet Union all the way up to the end of the war. However, as the German tanks started to get heavier and more armored, the 76 was not going to be as efficient at dealing with these threats. So the Soviet engineers went ahead and designed a brand new turret for this vehicle, much along the lines of what the US did with the Sherman. This new turret was going to incorporate a larger caliber ordnance, being the 85 millimeter. This new vehicle was known as the T-34-85. It entered into production and saw service with the Soviet Union from the middle portion of the war all the way up until basically up until recent history where these vehicles are still popping up from time to time in certain hotspots. The T-34 was mass produced by several manufacturing plants in the Soviet Union during the war and it was also in production by several of the Soviet aligned countries post World War II. Each one of these plants had their own little spin on the vehicle's design and many T-34 fictionals out there will be able to tell you which plants produced which vehicle and at which time. In total, over 80,000 of these units were produced, which is a very impressive number, and this vehicle did indeed help the Soviets defeat the Germans during World War II, and this vehicle here, since it was produced in such high numbers, is the reason why it is still seen all throughout the world today in several countries, and some of them, these vehicles are still in use. Before we continue with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when this model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this 176 scale Russian T-34 kit from Airfix. This model here is literally hot off the presses. I just came back from a day out at the shops and I couldn't help myself to purchase this kit over here because the price was just too good. It's an interesting kit and this was the antithesis of an impulse buy. The model here was purchased from Hobby Lobby and I'm pretty sure that now that I've stated that I'm gonna have several people complaining that I shopped at Hobby Lobby in the comments section to which my response is whatever, I do what I want. Say whatever you will about the store in the comment section below, but regardless, they do have some excellent deals from time to time on their plastic model kits and also on their clear plastic display cases. So there I was in Hobby Lobby just killing some time and I wandered into the plastic model aisle, which is something that I really, really shouldn't do. But regardless, I wandered in the aisle and I came across this kit over here. The kit was a very unique one caught my eye, the subject matter is cool, and also the price was something that I really couldn't turn away. $7.99 is a really good price for a plastic model kit, but today the model's purchase was that much more sweeter because it was actually a sale on plastic model kits that they were having in the store, and I was able to get the model for 40% off. So with tax and everything said and done, I got this model for a little over five bucks. Of course, this is a vintage model kit from the company Airfix. For those who don't know, Airfix is a British-based plastic model company, and they have been around now forever. They are one of the oldest companies that are still in existence, and their founding was like something in the late 1930s, but it really wasn't until the 1950s was when they entered into the injection-molded plastic model market. Obviously, for those UK viewers out there, this is a no-brainer. Of course, you know what Airfix is. It's really big in Europe, specifically in the UK, for reasons that should be fairly obvious. But Airfix was one of those companies that released a wide number of products in all sorts of different scales and also all sorts of different subject matters. Planes, ships, cars, and of course, for the purpose of this video here, their tank line. It wasn't until the, I believe, the 1960s or so, they went ahead and tooled up a range of kits in 176 scale, and this T-34 here is definitely one of them. The kit itself is a vintage model kit with the tooling. The tooling dates back to the late 1960s, I wanna say 1967, maybe 1968 or so, and these kits have been almost in constant production literally ever since. In fact, little ECA factoid, my very first plastic tank model kit ever was an Airfix Sherman tank, so, you know, I do have, even though I don't really work in 172 or 176, and I don't really build that many kits from Airfix, the Airfix 176 scale tank kit range does have a special place for me personally because of that fact. 
As for the tooling on the models, they always had some pretty decent tooling, specifically with the age of the kits themselves. Now, granted, I haven't worked on an Airfix model in many, many years, so it's going to be interesting to see how this one pans out. I, in fact, have no idea what this thing looks like even inside the carton. I just saw the box art, I saw the price, and blindly went on it. So, uh, it's going to be a learning experience for us all watching this video. The kit that we have here is a current production version, but like I stated before, this kit dates back to the 1960s. Airfix themselves have gone bust a number of times, and apparently now they have been purchased by another British company, I believe Hornby if I'm not mistaken, and because of that they are back into the market and they have been re-releasing many of their old vintage kits and this t34 obviously is included for the box art they went with the original pattern box or what i believe is the original pattern box art for their t34 kit as the years went on they would swap out the box arts from time to time but this one here much along the lines of what Atlantis did, they went with one of the first initial releases of the box art itself. Another thing that they went ahead and did was went back to what I believe is the original Airfix logo. This would change from time to time and the logo would be freshened up. But I believe, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, any UK builders out there, but I believe this might be the original logo from the vintage era. So starting with the box art and graphic design, here we have the kit in question. Obviously, the box art has many traits for its period, where it just has that 1960s aesthetics. If anyone has seen the Aurora box arts that I frequently bring up in the Aurora Park videos, it's very similar to some of the first generation Aurora box arts from that period. The model is not exactly the most accurately rendered, but it is obviously a you know, T-34-85. The scene is an action-packed scene with a lot of stuff going on in the background. And by and large, it's definitely a nice box art indeed. As for the typography, it's just typical black stroke over a white sans serif font. Gets you, it, pu it puts the point across on what the vehicle is. Only they just leave it as T-34. I'm not sure if the kit is a T-34-85 or a T-34-76. That's going to be something that I'm going to find out once I crack it open. Like I stated, I literally just got home from the store. The price tag, which is $7.99, like I stated before, this is the typical price, but I did purchase the model for a little bit less than that. Side tab of the box here, just a thumbnail of the main artwork found on the front. Same thing with the reverse side. Also in this section over here, we have some of the corporate information. And on the reverse tab, which is something that you don't generally see always, it actually has a brief history of the actual kit itself, which is pretty cool. It says here that the molds were made in 1968, and the illustration artist who did the box art is also credited right here and also has the date. Continuing with the verbiage, it also has a brief little history on the vehicle in question. On the side here, we have a nice little illustration of a T-3485, so I'm presuming that's what this kit is, and it's going to be interesting to see how this pans out. It's definitely a skill level 2, which means I should be more than capable of putting this one together. On the back panel of the box, we have here a cool little color chart for decal options, and it appears that the kit can be rendered either in the 76 format or the 85 format. They have a little advert here for the Humbrol paint. So actually, for a while, Airfix was owned by Humbrol, and then I guess both companies went under, and now the parent company owns both, so why not advertise the paints there? And there's just something about using Humbrols on an Airfix kit. It just seems proper, I suppose, but that's really all there is to it. So, the box is currently taped shut. This is the factory seal. It's not like it's a... Re Hopefully, it's not a return or anything and I got suckered into. The model is a side opening tab format, much along the lines of the Eshi kits that are 172. So here we go, I'm cracking it open for the first time ever. Okay, dumping out the contents for added suspense. Of course I dumped it out with the instruction side up. Pretty thick pad of instructions for such a simple vehicle, but we'll circle back to that. And here goes the kit in question, sealed in its hermetically sealed bag. Let's go ahead and open that up. OK, 
Okay, so obviously being a vintage model kit, this thing is going to be as simple as possible. Everything is going to be made out of injection molded plastic, with the exception of this tracks, which are single piece vinyl. And you're not going to have any sort of modern accoutrements found on this kit here. So no PE, no resin, no metal sections. It's all old school injection molded polystyrene. Everything is molded in this green color, which is typical for model tank kits, specifically of this era. It wouldn't be until the 80s or the 90s when companies would switch over to that gray color. But, you know, there's something cool about a tank being made in green plastic. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at the quality of the molding. Starting with the camera up close here on the upper hull, you have to see what the details look like on the plastic moldings. First, I want to say that the moldings themselves are very clean. They're nicely molded. I'm not seeing any sort of things like flash or other type of impurities. The detailing found on the sections themselves are also pretty decent. Again, specifically for the scale and the age that these kits were designed in. If I'm not mistaken, I believe that Airfix had some pretty good reference material at the time, being the example of a T3476 and the 85 that were housed in the Bobbington Tank Collection. Even in the 1960s time frame, I believe that both of those examples were accessible to the public and were on display. So back to this example over here, like I was touching upon before, many of the details which normally would be separate molded sections that would be glued on are integrally molded onto the surface. Things like the grab handles, side skirts, hatches, you know, stuff like that. Some of the details are a bit overly simplistic, like for instance the grills sections found on the top, as well as the most iconic fan grill detailing, which would be right here on the back. They do have the slats present, but the mesh work is absent on this rendition. From the upper hull takes to the row wheels, and the moldings over here have the basic overall look and shape of the T34 row wheels. However, they are missing some of the other surface details on them, which would be things like the fasteners. On this portion of the runner, we have sections for a tart, and by looking at the moldings over here, I was correct with my assumption where this kit gives you the option to render this vehicle in one of two configurations, either with the T3485 turret or with the T3476 turret. So that means I'm off to buy another one of these at a certain point, but uh, more on that, I guess, for another video. Back to the quality of the moldings. You can see the turret sides here for the T3476. Again, it has the overall look and shape of the 76 pattern of turret. Just like with the hull, it has the grab handles integrally molded on. And on this portion here, we have the roof for both the 76 and the 85. 85 has a separate molded hatch, while on the 76, everything is molded solid. The 85 does have some of the more usual detailings present, such as the loader's hatch, the periscope, and the distinctive double sphere air filtration system found on the rear portion of the turret. Here we have the mantlet for the 85 along with the cupola hatch. And here we have the armament. Top is the 76, the bottom is the 85. Here we got some more superficial details such as the two front tow hook mounts, a headlight, and the bow MG. Bow MG appears to have a little bit of flash on it, but you know, that should polish up with a little bit of neophile work. Here we have some storage bins for the side portion of the tin work. And that's basically it for this runner. And that leads us to the next runner here, which contains more wheels. Oh wow, look at that. It looks like I was mistaken. I recant my previous statement where I said that the wheels do not have any surface detailing on them, such as the fasteners. They do, but those are only found on the outer portion of the wheels. These are the inner portion, so I stand corrected. The wheels, you can, once it focuses in, you can see the detailing present. They do have the faster detailing, and they are in the pretty intricate pattern found on the T34, where if you've seen a real one, you'll know what I'm talking about. And also a nice little bit of detailing that they molded in are the distinctive little spheres that are molded into the rubber tire sections. And again, this is a very T34 bit of detailing and they are present on the model. Only rather than being holes, which they are on the real T34, these are actually little bumps. So regardless, you do have some detailing there and it'll probably pop out pretty well during the weathering phase. Here you can see the sprocket and the idler. 
Of course, all the holes are there, but they are molded solid. This is probably gonna be something I'll be taking care of with a pin vise. Final drive blisters are present. Exhaust manifolds are also present and have some decent detailing rendered on. Here are the side fuel canisters. Some of the remaining bits consist of the hull sections. The hull is a multi-piece assembly where we have a bottom pan flanked by the two side sections. This was a manufacturing technique that was fairly commonly done back then. If we can recall, the kits from Aurora did this very frequently, as also did the kits from Renwall. And this was done because it allows you to easily mold these sections here and also get the detailing integrally rendered on, such as the swing arm detailing, which is present on the bottom portion here of the T-34. On the 85 turret, get to see the detailing, again, molded in these sections. The geometry of the T-34-85 turret itself looks to be pretty decent, again, for what it is, and I'm pretty sure it should build and flesh out into a nicely detailed piece overall. On the components here, I will say that you don't have any more of the modern amenities like cast texturing or anything like that. Like I stated before, this is definitely a vintage kit through and through. Of course, the last runner to mention does not consist of plastic parts, instead are made of single piece vinyl, which is how it should be. The vinyl tracks are present on all of the Airfix kits. This wouldn't be until Eshi would change this up in the 1980s where they would introduce individual Lincoln Lane track and then we have been forever doomed as armor modelers under the cloud of that mistake but as for the one supply with this kit they are pretty basic for again the molding era but on the surface over here you do get to see the waffle pattern found on the T-34 track it Definitely has the look and feel of the T-34 track, although it may not be super pattern accurate, but it definitely, you look at it and you can tell it's for a T-34. On the inside portion here, we do have the guide teeth molded on, but there is no inner hinge detailing present on these moldings. The tracks themselves, you have some nice flexibility to them and have a little bit of stretch. From the tracks takes us to the literature. Well, before that, we have here a set of water slide decals. Just typical blue paper water slides with some basic Russian markings on them. We have some stars, a number three, and also a unit marking. The quality of the decals look to be pretty decent. I mean, they look like contemporary quality of decals, so if they're anything like the ones I've ran into on the Monogram or the Atlantis kits, I think these decals should work just fine. Also, I want to mention that on the box here, it says that the decals are from Cartograph, which is a fairly well-known decal company. And from my workings with some of their stuff in the past, their decals seem to work pretty well. So we'll see how that holds up when we get to this one here. So this now brings us to the instructions, and the instructions look a bit homebrew, if I may say. They feel like the type of thing that someone would print off on their laser printer at home and then just, you know, fold up, but they're pretty much uh, everything you need to know. I, if I was to take a guess, I'd see that these are the original instructions. They don't look like to be CAD drawings or anything. These are hand-drawn, hand-drafted instructions, which you would expect to see on a kit from this era. And, you know, it looks like it'll do the job just fine. And that's basically it. So, really, it's a fairly simple build. Let's see how it actually goes together. Here's the model assembled. And at this point here, it's ready to head off into paint. When I first started this project, I wasn't anticipating anything that I wanted to super detail or nothing along those lines. I just wanted to build it primarily out of the box and leave it in that format. I mean, after all, this was an impromptu build that was something that, again, was more of an impulse buy more than anything else. Well, as uh, when one thing leads to another, I'm basically like a little dog seeing the mail truck drive by and I'm compelled to go and chase it. And I couldn't help myself to go ahead and add a few scratch build details, improving several of the surface details found on this model, bringing it up to the configuration that we have it here. So I might as well take the opportunity to show these details in this format here, because even though they will look great once the model is fully painted, weathered, and completed, seeing the model in this format is something that will better lend 
to the explanation and also the materials that were used in order to improve the build, bringing it up to the condition that you're going to see it once fully completed. With the tart removed, this allows you, the viewer, to see the hull details now in better light. Starting with the front section over here, you can see the addition of these three handles that have been added to the sides. The kit originally have these details molded into the surface, but again, they are just little blades that are molded into the plastic. In order to improve the model, I simply just amputated the molded in sections with a sharp exacto and before I polished them down further I took a small Dremel bit on a pin vise and I drilled out the two locations where each of the grab handles would go. By having the original shards left this gives you a, an exact idea on where the first and second hole need to be drilled and it removes a lot of the guesswork. Once the holes are drilled the sides are polished away with some sandpaper leaving for a smooth surface and then it's ready for me to add the new handles. The handles themselves are made out of very thin floor wire and I just simply bent them to shape with a small plier and fitted them to the new holes that were drilled into the surface. The kit originally actually has four of these handles that are found on the surface. The other one's right here behind the handle, or I should say or behind the fuel tank here. However, that one was amputated and thoroughly removed because generally it's just not there on real T-34s, or at least from the ones that I've seen. And it's just best not to have it. So I just amputated that one outright and just kept the other three that we see here. From the handles takes us to the most notable modification that was made to the hull and that involves the fuel tank details. The fuel tanks are supplied with the kit, they are just a two piece assembly that you glue them together and then they get dropped into the corresponding location found here on the upper hull. Overall it's a really simple bit of detailing to fabricate and then secure in place. However the kit fuel tanks do leave a bit of room to be desired. The first thing I just want to mention, and it's one that I did not change on this build, is that, in my opinion, the tanks themselves are overscaled. To me, they look like they're more or less either 172 or possibly 150, and keep in mind the tank is 176. So, in my opinion, they are larger compared to what they would be on a two-scale T-34. However, that doesn't mean, you know, they can't be polished up and improve further and that's what you see what I've done here. So with notwithstanding that the tanks are out of scale, I went ahead and just simply gave them a detailed facelift because you know for all intents and purposes for this build here, I think they're perfectly fine. The one modification that I did was adding the slit line that we have right here in the center where the two tanks are found. Like I stated before, these are two sections that get glued together and when you do that you just have a natural seam running along these sections over here. The seam is there, but it's a bit crude with the way, you know, the two sections adhere. And once you sand them down, you're going to lose that center seam. Now, normally this is something that you want to get rid of. However, for this application here, that's really not the best because again, on the real T-34, these are two tanks that are just, you know, side by side to one another. So a natural seam is going to be there. On the model over here, fortunately where the seam is is exactly where the seam would be on the real one. So to add it, I simply took this unit, put it in my lathe, and with a X-Acto saw, I was able to carve the seam line that we have on these two examples. You don't want to cut all the way through, you just want to put a nice little indentation which will give the visual significance of there being two separate tanks. Once the line was added, the remainder was polished down with some sandpaper, leaving for the end result that we have here. Once that was completed, the next thing to do was to fabricate the strap details, which are absent on the stock Airfix kit. The straps you see here are fabricated out of very thin strips of aluminum. The aluminum that I used was actually from a soda can, and so you know it's not exactly a really high-end, high-budget type situation. It's just you know you take a scissor and you cut two little thin strips from the soda can itself. They were bent to shape and then secured to the following locations. Once they are added, they give you the strap detailing that would really help the model compared to just leaving them strapless. Outside of that, two other straps were added to the front and rear sections because again on the real T-34 these are actually little handles and they would be present on these areas. The handles have a little bit more geometry compared to the way you see them here. For this one here I basically just fudged it by having a small little strap found in these areas. It's something that again it really improves the detailing. Could it be enhanced further? Possibly, but for the time I had allocated for this build here, the simple detailing like you see on this model is again more than suffice.
The other thing that I added, which was really a quick little addition, were the fuel caps that are found on the four top sections. These are just sewing pins that I just drilled into the two canisters over here with a pin vise, and then the sewing pins were snipped to shape and then secured in these locations. Once everything is painted, this is really going to come out and it's going to really enhance the build compared to leaving everything stock. While on the lower hull, it takes us to the suspension and you can see that I went ahead and made a quick little modification to the sprockets. The sprockets on the T-34 are perforated and these perforations are present on the Airfix tooling, but are molded solid as I touched upon before. In order to enhance it with a pin vise and with a small Dremel bit, I just simply drilled out these locations over here and in about five minutes time, both of the sprockets were completed. In addition to doing this modification to the sprockets, I also went ahead and did the exact same modification here to the front idlers. And that brings us now to the turret, or I should say turrets, plural. Of course, the kit gives you the option between rendering this build with the 85 variant or the 76 variant, and although this build is going to be an 85 variant, there's no real purpose of having this thing languish away in my spare bin. So, you know what? I had the idea to go ahead and just build the turret up and just keep it painted so, you know, if I ever want to display the model in the T3485 configuration, I can. But I also have the opportunity to swap it out and roll with it as a 76. So it's a nice feature indeed. That doesn't change the fact that I'm probably going to get another one of these builds to have it as a dedicated 76, but rest assured I probably also have a switchable turret on that one too, but that would be a topic for another video. So starting with the 85 millimeter turret, it goes together relatively easily. It's, you know, about two or three pieces and they go together pretty good, namely the sides and also the trunnion section. However, the one area that I found that required a little bit of hand fitting, or not, not so much hand fitting, but polishing, was with the roof. The roof does drop on as a one plate assembly. However, the fit on the inner recesses over here does leave for some room for improvement. You can assemble it out of the box with the kit piece unaltered just fine, but it will, in my opinion, stick up slightly from the surface over here, and this will possibly add some complications when you're doing the seam removal work. For this build here, what I went ahead and did was with a Dremel with a small router bit, I actually deleted the molded in recess found around the top sections here of the turret sides. And with that material removed, the turret was then able to fit in place in a much more refined manner. It's nice and flat. And this made the addition of the seam removal a bit easier. And on that note, yes, there is a bit of a seam line that runs along the top section here of the snake head, which is I always call it on these tanks, or these Russian tanks specifically. And this was something that was polished away with some thick super glue and just with a little bit of sandpaper. You just put a nice little bead in the location that you need to, you let it set, and then just polish it down and it polishes away pretty well, leaving for a pretty seamless appearance. Of course, on the top section here, you want to be careful on some of the molding and details to avoid any collateral damage or to mitigate as much as possible. And when you're done, it should come out pretty well. On the turret sides, just like with the hull, I amputated the molded in handle and replaced them with ones made from metal wire. This was done with the exact same technique as the ones mentioned on the hull, so no point going about that any further. One other addition that I made was to the texture. Of course, a T3485 turret is very roughly casted, and I went ahead and built that feature into the model here, which is definitely something that's going to be more appreciated after the model's fully painted. The texture technique on this one is a little bit different compared to the other ones that I mentioned in these videos where I use red putty and I stepple it. This one here, I still use the same stepling technique, but instead of red putty, I just use thick super glue. I took my super glue that I have here, which is, by the way, the stuff that I used to build the entire model with. I add a little like zigzag pattern here on the sides. And then with my finger, I go ahead and do the exact same stepling technique that I touched upon in the other videos. Once it's complete, you get a nice rough texture. That's by and large all in scale, specifically for 172, but being Russian, you know, that definitely helps. And this is something that will greatly improve the look of the model, bringing it up more, I guess, to the standards as some of the other super kits that are on the market. And it's a simple way to enhance the model compared to just leaving it with the out-of-the-box offering. Of course, this is a technique that you should only do if you have the proper 
you know, technique and tools at, at your disposal. Otherwise, you can just build it out of the box and just, you know, make it smooth and, you know, be totally happy with it. In addition to this turret now, this brings us to the 76 turret. 76 turret received basically all of the same modifications and detailing that went into this one, which again would include the handles, the, the texturing, but this one I noticed that the fit was a little bit more of a challenge compared to the 85 turret in regards to the roof. It was still able to be mounted on in place, and unlike the 85, I didn't have to remove any of the side sections but the gap found on the area where the top meets the sides i found it to be a bit more substantial compared to the one on the 85 millimeter turret of course this is something that is not a deal breaker and obviously i was able to contend with it with the same technique that i used on the 85 again b to ca hand sanding and then you're good to go and once it's done again it leads for some nice results of course the model was textured in the same technique that I showed before and this is something that's again going to be more noticeable once the model is fully painted. So starting with the model's running gear all of the components you see here are stock out of the box and were mounted basically as per the instructions. The only deviation that I made was like I mentioned before I drilled out the small little holes found on the idler as well as on the sprockets and now that the model is fully completed you really get to see just how much more it improves the build as opposed to just leaving them in the standard configuration. Also, as I frequently mention, if you do not have a pin vise, the tooling, or even the small skill sets required to drill these sections out, you definitely do not want to undertake this because you can potentially cause damage to the parts, and if you screw up the parts, it's not like something you have any spares of. So this is, again, something that's really more or less left for someone that has the, the equipment and the skill sets aside to take care of a, or I should say to undertake, a procedure like that. But it is one that if you do have those skill sets and the and the tools on hand, definitely go ahead and, and go through the motions because it really does improve the build overall. When it comes time to install the components, this is done pretty easily. The parts line up pretty well. However, I do want to mention that this is not the type of model that the kit will have any sort of playability with it in the regards where if you go ahead and push the model the wheels will roll and so will the tracks that's not really what this kit's intended for this kit's intended for the parts to be glued on into the appropriate locations and left in that type of format in a static configuration of course this model does have some playability to it specifically if you're a younger person but i'll circle back on that towards the end of the video when i go over recommendations but as for any sort of functionality of these parts here the answer is a no and the parts are not made to roll. As for the track, the track is again the kit supplied single piece vinyl tracks. They assemble very easily and I found that the tension was pretty good. The tracks were not overly tight or overly loose. They were basically the correct tension required in order to secure to the model, secure to the model easily without causing any extra strain on the axles on either the front or the rear. And also with the way the track is designed, it does have ample amount of material so that you can glue it onto the top portion of the road wheels like I've done in this manner. This is done with a small little drop of very thin super glue and once the sections are glued in place it really does a fairly decent job of mimicking the track sag which would be present on this vehicle. Just like with the the whole procedure if you do not have those skill sets or even the glues on hand to achieve that just leave it stock out of the box and just roll with it in that format because if you do not have the appropriate glues for that it's just not going to work for you so if you're the type of person that use red tube model glue first don't <laughs> stop what you're doing you know um you know look into some other types of adhesives but also you're not going to be able to really do this type of effect if you're using that type of a medium and although these tracks are the vintage and the material that they are, you can see that once they are glued to the top portion of the wheels, it really gives the model a more polished appearance as opposed to leaving them in the stock tension format. Of course, the tracks being vinyl, I definitely want to mention that you do not want to use spray paints to paint these tracks. It's something that I mentioned basically all of my videos for the same reasons. Spray paints, although they are very convenient in order to apply a base coat, you definitely don't want to apply them to tracks because they can have a multitude of different effects depending on the company that you're using and the vintage and company brand of the tracks. Sometimes they can cause damage to the tracks where the tracks will start decomposing or melting on you when the, plane, when the paint is applied or 
they'll just dry rot and crumble on you as the model ages. So in order to avoid that, I personally found that I use Tamiya acrylics. It's applied via the airbrush. Tamiya XF1 or flat black is my color of choice. And then I go ahead and weather it with the airbrush and dry brushing to the effects that you see here. I found that if you paint your single piece vinyl tracks in this format, it will prevent the tracks from dry rotting over time. And so far I have builds that are exceeding past a decade now and the tracks are in the same condition as they were when I first built the model. So, so far it seems like the Tamiya tracks, or I should say the Tamiya paint is the best way to ensure that your model's tracks stay in this, it, nice and flexible and do not dry rot as the model ages. Or I should say it's the best way to give your model the best chances of having it age and age in a way that it doesn't cause any problems. Outside the suspension, this brings us to the front details and all the details you see on this model are stock out of the box. This includes the two front hooks, the MG, as well as the headlight. These components are all separately molded parts and you do want to be very careful when you remove them off of the sprue because of the very small size. These are the type of things that can easily fling off the lost party and if they do, you're going to be basically screwed because you don't have any spares. The other thing I want to mention about some of these parts is that they do have some finite amount of flash on them. And the flash is the type of thing that polishes away very, very easily. You're going to use basically your best modeling friends, which includes some sandpaper, a needle file, and also a sharp X-Acto. Just going up and down the surfaces with an X-Acto was more than enough, I found, to de-flash some of these components. And a needle file and some very fine sandpaper can be used as well in case the part are very frail, like, for instance, the Bow MG over here. If you don't want to snap that little guy off, you know, perhaps some thin sandpaper probably might be a better bet for you. However, the flash was very small and removed very, very easy and effortlessly with the methods that I just mentioned. Same is true for the rear details as well, which include both the hooks and we also have here the two exhaust manifolds. The manifolds are actually nicely rendered in detail for the size that they are, and outside that small little flash that I mentioned, they install pretty good and effortlessly. Carry on brings us to the rear fuel tanks, and as I mentioned before, these did receive several modifications and extra details in order to spruce them up from the kit original. Now that the model is fully painted, you can really get a good idea on exactly how much they improved the model overall. And honestly, I think that the addition of the details I just mentioned really enhances this model quite a bit, and it really does take it from the original kit condition and kit configuration. Jumping ahead briefly to the weathering, you can see that I went ahead and weathered them in the same format that I touched upon on a number of other builds, where I have the the sweaty, oily effects, which would not be uncommon specifically for these type of bits of equipment. Trying to top off fuel canisters like this is always something that's haphazard. You're always going to get drips, and something like spilled diesel fuel will just attract dirt and grime to it, basically like a magnet. So. I went ahead and weathered it in the following format. This is just basically a little bit of gloss black, and then I also take a little brush of Tamiya Gloss Clear, and I add it to certain locations or to give the effects that you see currently. It's something that once done gives the build a lot of extra character, and it gives it just a lot of extra life. Also on this portion of the model, you can see those grab handles that I mentioned before. Obviously this really enhances the build overall as opposed to the original molded in ones. But just like I frequently mention, if you do not have the equipment for that, just leave the molded in ones and just, you know, build the kit in the standard configuration. Moving upward brings us to the turret, and clearly here we have the 76 millimeter turret. Like I mentioned before, there was a substantial little seam found on the section over here where the top plate makes contact with the side sections. This I did touch upon earlier, how the seam was polished away with some thick super glue and a little bit of sandpaper. And now that the model is fully painted, you can see that it blends in absolutely perfectly. If you go ahead and take your time with the seam removal, and if you have the techniques and the tools for that, you can see how it could polish the model into something that's very, very nice, as opposed to just leaving it with the big seams that are present. Again, it's going to require a little bit of extra work and technique by the builder, but the juice is most certainly worth the squeeze. Hopefully the grab handle and the cast texture detail pops up on camera, but again, it's just another way to enhance the model overall. While we're on the target, you can see that I went ahead and painted a little periscope with the prism detailing, which is a thin little swipe of gloss black. It's something that really takes a bit of nerve, and if you have a nice, precise paintbrush for this, this will definitely make the job more doable. The tube can go up and down. As you can see, elevation works absolutely perfectly. And the rotation is very smooth on the model 
as the turret actually is, you know, nicely designed in that regard. I also went ahead and added another little drop of gloss black right there to the domed periscope. With the 85 turret popped in place, you can see the same details that I referenced earlier with the grab handles. Hopefully the cast texture comes out. It's one of those things that it's just hard to get into focus, specifically with a model this small, but hopefully you can see it right over here popping through the paint. And also on this one here, like I touched upon before, the seam work was contended with in the same manner that I mentioned before on the other turret. One other thing that I wanted to mention is that on the Airfix kit, for some reason, there's a blister found in this section over here, and that blister is just not found on the real vehicle. So this was something that was polished away during construction. I went ahead and utilized a needle file for this, and it made short work of deleting that blister and also flaring it into the remaining bodywork found on the turret. Just like with the other unit, the periscopes were painted with a little swipe of gloss black. The barrel, of course, can't elevate up and down, which you can see right here. Turret can freely rotate. And also, the turret's details are pretty good, I found, specifically once the paint and weathering goes on. It holds up pretty well with the fine way that they are molded. The last thing I want to mention is with the end of the barrel, the kit does have a flash suppressor or what looks to be a flash suppressor integrally molded onto the barrel end. Obviously, this is something that would not be found on a T3485. Unfortunately, with how long the barrel is, you can snip off that little section over there and it actually enhances the model's accuracy as opposed to causing any problems. So, quick little snip of the fine, or of the uh, clean cut snips and voila, the barrel's at the correct length and also has the correct profile. Which, at this time, it kind of reminds me, actually, of the original Ravel T3485 kit that came out in probably 1954, 1955 or so. And that one also, for some reason, has a muzzle brake molded on the end. I don't know. For some reason, they thought these Russian tanks all had muzzle brakes on them. But that's not the case specifically with the T3485. Unless we're talking about the Teskey tank for Chulo, but, you know, that's a topic for another video for another day. And that's all there is for the detail work, and this leads us to the paint and the markings. For the model's paint work, I went with a later war shade of Russian olive green, and this is the same type of color that I've touched upon on a few other videos. Most notably, the Joseph Stalin 3 Old Tank Repair video comes to mind because it's not just the same exact paint, but it's also basically the same configuration with the aerial recognition cross painted along the turret. Like I mentioned before, this is probably my favorite scheme found on Russian vehicles from the late war and also into the post-war years and it's one that's very iconic and it just looks so good on Russian armor be it a T-34 or a Joseph Stalin. The vehicle was painted in the exact same manner as I showed in that other video with the base coat being applied with the airbrush. The base coat is exterior latex paint of a shade that I went ahead and mixed up. It's based on the Model Master Russian World War II green color that they had a number of years ago when Model Master went belly up. I went ahead and basically made a clone of that paint in gallon format, and that's the paint that I used over here. The remainder of the paintwork, or I should say the remainder of the weathering work, was done with my usual format with the use of washes, filters, and dry brushing. For the cross on the turret, or I should say the aero recognition stripes on the turret, this was applied via the paintbrush. This is done for several reasons. First, there's no stencil or decal for this that's applied with this model. And on top of that, in my opinion, the paintbrush method always works the best for these aero recognition markings. On the real tanks, they were applied via a paintbrush. And in my opinion, when I've seen individuals use stencils or or if they use a decal to achieve this type of look, it just looks too machine made, right? It, like I said before, these things were all done by hand paint, so they're gonna be rough, they're not gonna be square, and it just adds to the personality of the build. And this is best done with the paintbrush format. Now, of course, just because you have to use a paintbrush, it doesn't mean, you know, it's really easily done. The paint does have to be at the proper consistency. You have to have a good paintbrush for this, and it will take probably two or three coats, depending on the thinness of the paint, in order to get the look that you have here. On the Stalin, I mentioned I use just standard flat white exterior house paint. Same thing is true for this one here. It's the same exact paint, watered down in the same manner, and applied in, you guessed it, the same exact format. Once the paint is applied, though, it definitely looks very, very good and just gives the vehicle all that much more extra character. 
And not only was this paintwork applied to the 85 tart, but I went with the exact same scheme here for the 76. Now, a few people, or I should say a few T34 aficionados are going to point out that this turret might not necessarily work with the aerial recognition stripes because this was something that was more or less seen at the very tail end of the war. So we're looking at Battle of Berlin and that type of format. And by this point here, the T-34s that were generally seen in service were the ones with the 85 millimeter turret. That is absolutely true. However, there is a photograph out there. I have it in one of my books where it shows the Battle of Berlin. There's a row of T-34s with white stripes painted haphazardly on the turret, I might add. And one of them is a T-34-76. Granted, not with this early pattern turret, but it is one of the other T-34-76 that are out there. So the... The concept of having this type of turret here with these stripes is definitely one that is most certainly plausible. And that doesn't take away exactly how awesome it looks with the model in this format. Like I said before, I just love Russian tanks with this type of a marking setup. The paint was applied in the same exact way as I mentioned before. And again, since this model here, this is just basically an extra accessory, you know, why not? So I went ahead and painted it in the following format. The markings that you see here are the stock decals that came with the model, as I showed earlier. And from my experience with applying the decals on both the two turrets, I got to say that the quality of the decals were absolutely excellent. The decals were flawless. The quality was great. They applied on without any sort of problems. And they adhered onto the surface and were glazed over absolutely perfectly with the VMS matte varnish. This is a product that I've touched upon in a bunch of these videos for good reason. I absolutely love this varnish. It does the trick every single time and it yields for some excellent results. As you can see, the decals are absolutely perfect and there's no need to scrounge for any other type of markings if you're just looking to build this model with the out of the box components. In the end, I couldn't be any happier in how this build turned out. Like I mentioned before, this was something that was an impromptu build, and this was not something that I was actively looking out, you know, searching and hunting for. So having the model come into my possession in the manner that it has is definitely one that I do not regret. The build was an excellent little build. It was really, really fast. I had it basically wrapped up within a day or so. So, you know, whenever you get a build from start to finish built to this type of you know, end result here in that type of short period of time, it's definitely something that doesn't happen that often. So when it does, it's, you know, always something that is greatly appreciated. Like I stated before, because of the dual turret nature that this kit does have, I wouldn't mind acquiring another one of these models next time I ever encounter one in the wild. So I could build it up as a predominant, or I should say as a dedicated T-3476, as opposed to this model over here, which is more or less intended to be left in the 85 format. Regardless, the fact that it has this switchable turret feature is something that is pretty cool. And this is the perfect point to swing us into recommendations. Now, for the Airfix 176 scale T-34 kit, would this be something I would recommend to a beginner? Um, I'll give it a maybe, at most. These kits are intended to be simple builds. In fact, they were more or less intended to be built by, you know, children back in the day. Having said that, they do have some curveball stem that can potentially lead to issues, specifically if the builder is really unaccustomed to working with plastic models. Namely, with the hull, the way it's a multi-piece assembly, this is something that could potentially cause issues, specifically if the individual is just rushing and going through the motions. You do have to take your time, making sure the parts are properly aligned, and then once the glue's set, you could continue from there. On top of that, this kit does have several small components that need to be assembled, and these are the type of things that could potentially break off and fling off the Lost Party, but then again, that's true for most model kits out there, regardless of the skill level of the individual. But, you know, if a person is not used to working with smaller parts, this is something that could potentially lead to issues. The last thing that came to my mind about this build that can potentially give a novice beginner a run for his money would be the fit of some of the turret components. As I mentioned before, the fit on some of these pieces are a bit loose and some hand fitting is going to be required. It's nothing too egregious, but again, if someone is a beginner straight off the boat and has never built a plastic model kit before, this is something that may give them a bit of extra difficulty. This is more or less something that I would recommend for someone that already has done maybe two or three builds under their belt. So they are still technically a beginner, but they're definitely, this is not something to just go in 
out of the blue, never touching a plastic model kit before. You probably couldn't, you know, do that avenue. You might may be able to make out okay, but it's definitely something that I would hazard to bump your brakes on and maybe, you know, do one of these as your second or third kit, you know, down the line. As for an intermediate builder, oh yeah, you know, someone with that type of skill set can easily tackle one of these builds, and an advanced builder can obviously probably do one of these with their eyes blindfolded. However, the other two skill sets that I just mentioned probably have already built one of these kits or a few of these kits in the past in their youth, and if that's the case, you may find these kits to be a tad bit underwhelming considering, you know, what you are accustomed to for plastic model kits. If you are someone with an intermediate to an advanced range, more than likely you're gonna be wanting to seek something that's a little bit more advanced, like some of the other 172 or 176 scale kits that are on the market. Some of which come to mind would be the ones from Dragon, and I believe there are a few from Fujimi, and if I'm not mistaken, I think there might be some other more modern tooling kits from the Eastern Block area. I'm a little hazy on this scale, but I do know that there are lots of other options available, and if you are looking for something that has more detailing on it, I would steer more towards something with a modern tooling. Like, again, something from Dragon, for instance, comes to mind. But although these kits are as old as they are, that's definitely not something to discount. They still build very well, in my opinion, and you can turn one around and customize it to your heart's content. Taking something that's a rather basic, simplistic model and adding many other scratch-built or even just spare details that you have in your spare box, all of which can be added to one of these kits here to further enhance it, bring it up from this stock kit condition. As we saw for this one here, I just went ahead and did some basic scratch building parts to it and it really polished the model off quite well. Probably the kit's biggest asset that it has is that, in my opinion, Airfix did an excellent job with the overall scale and dimensions. The vehicle looks like a T3485 or like a T3476. Because it has the basic size and dimensions pretty much squared away. Everything else on top of that is just basic icing on a cake. So if you have some extra spare parts lying around your spare bin from another project, or if you just have some aftermarket parts lying around and you want to use them for something, those would greatly be used to enhance one of these older kits here to really polish it up and to make it something a bit more special. And I think at this point, we're basically now in recommendation. So, the type of person I recommend this kit to, well, first and foremost, anyone who's into braille scale modeling. If you're the type of individual that really digs working on smaller scale tank kits, be it in 172 or in this case 176, the Airfix kits here are definitely a no-brainer. Even though this kit here is 176, is basically in the same ballpark with 172, and it's not uncommon for you to have a 170 second scale collection, and you can sprinkle some 176 scale kits in there, and they will blend in absolutely perfectly. This is very similar to, you know, 135th scale individuals like myself, where we have kits in 135 and also 132, and, you know, the two actually play nice with each other quite well in that regard. The Airfix kits tend to be very prolific, and because of that, the prices on them are very affordable. They have been in production for a very long period of time, so tracking one down shouldn't be too difficult from the various venues that you purchase your plastic models from. Because of that, and if you add to the mix the fact that there's a lot of kits in the Airfix range, this really makes the addition of these kits here one that would improve any small-scale model tank collection quite a bit. Another person who I'd recommend these kits to would be anyone who's into wargaming. If you're the type of person that does the large tabletop wargaming, these Airfix kits here were always something that were to be considered. For basically the same reasons that I just mentioned before. There's a lot of variation of kits out there, they're fairly affordable, they're very easily obtained, and on top of that, they're also really easily built. All of these factor in to be an excellent asset if you really want to flesh out your ranks, your wargaming tackle box. On top of that, because this kit here does have the feature of the switchable turrets, this too adds extra variation and also extra adaptability as opposed to just having the vehicle with one type of turret. Another individual that this kit here would be a definite no-brainer for would be anyone who's either a die-hard T-34 fan or if you're just a fan of World War II armor as well as World War II Russian armor or just Russian armor in general. Each of the individuals I just mentioned would really appreciate this kit here added to their collection. Yet another person I'd recommend this kit to would be anyone who is a fan and aficionado of collecting and building vintage model kits. Because this kit here is quite literally a vintage model kit, this model here fits right into your collection without batting an eye.
And because this kit here is, again, as cheap and as abundant as they are, trying to track one of these down should not be difficult. And unlike many of the other kits out there that are antique and are collectible, this one here, you get to scratch that vintage itch without having to break the piggy bank, so to speak. And while we're at it, I could throw another person who would be recommended this kit, and this is again true for many other kits of a similar vintage, would be someone who's built this kit in the past and are looking to re-enter into the hobby. If There's a lot of people out there who I've encountered that built models when they were younger, you know, back in the day. They've, you know, moved out of the hobby for one reason or another, but now they want to get back into it. If that's you, this kit here would be a nice welcome back into the hobby. These kits here are not overly complex to build, and because of that, you know, you get to slide back into the hobby, like putting on an old pair of slippers, unlike trying something that's a little bit more advanced, like some of the other more advanced kits that I do mention and have done reviews of on this channel. Along similar lines, this kit here would be the excellent type of project to share with a youth builder. If you're a, a parent, a grandparent, or an uncle, or something along those lines, and you're looking to spend some nice quality time with a nephew or your son or daughter, this kit here is a great way to do it. They build very easy and very quickly, and because of that, they are very youth friendly. On top of that, I could personally say for this for myself, afterwards the the individual would love to play with this thing, although if they do, you know, the parts may not last too long. Having said that, you know, these models do have some playability to them. I would know that's literally how I entered into this lovely hobby that I'm doing now. So if you're the type of person that are looking to spend some quality time with, you know, a family member or someone that's very special to you, one of these airfix kits here are definitely a fun and interesting way to do this. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 176 scale Russian T-34-76 or T-34-85 medium tank. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posts of content being small scale model showcase videos like this one over here or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop new post content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular build, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been seen on this channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detailed components. Thanks again. I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Till then.